Genesis 10, the table of nations. And uh, again, uh, we could talk about, and we have talked about Moses and his, the glimpse that we get into his intellect uh, and the way he structured things uh, uh, in this particular uh, writing, uh, the uh, opening uh, pages of, of the Torah. Uh, and we see it once again in the, uh, the symmetry here is when he names these nations, there, there are 70 of them in terms of the descendants of, of uh, Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, uh, the way they're listed in order, the way they're structured, who's included, who's not included, so that there would be 70. So again, seven biblically, that number of seven days of creation, that name of perfection or completeness. So when we get to 70, we see that it is the complete table of nations. That's the, the message. As we get to the end of Genesis, we'll see the descendants of Abraham number in 70. That's all of them in their completeness. As we get to the New Testament, and Jesus is sending his disciples out to proclaim the gospel, he will send out 70 disciples to proclaim the gospel in, uh, in Israel. Again, there's nothing random about what uh, Moses writes uh, here in the opening chapters of, of Genesis, nor else in any of his writing. What we do see from the, the table of nations is an interrelatedness of all peoples on, on the planet. And uh, our DNA comes from the same source. Uh, we are united one to another by two things, by ancestry and by responsibility to a creator. We're all, in a sense, related to each other, and therefore we have the same, same needs and same felt needs and, uh, and needs in our life. Uh, and we are all made in the image of God with the ability to know him and call out to him uh, and, uh, and have a relationship with him. Uh, and because of this, then, when Jesus gives the Great Commission, it can be to all the nations uh, because every person needs to hear the gospel wants to deep in their heart be uh, in a relationship with God. And that's one of the things that's very cool about being in a place of another culture, another language, uh, and preach the gospel and see people re respond. And I saw it early on in the trips to, uh, to Japan, but I uh, just recall, uh, did, you know, most of what I would do when I would go to India would be ministering to guys that are ministering in terms of pas uh, pastor's conferences and missions conferences. But... Uh, uh, Mike Stengel and I were called at the last minute to go preach at this open air uh, gathering, uh, which uh, was outside of Madras, and the first time I'd ever done something like that. And I'm obviously uh, sharing and preaching through a translator, but to just give the simple gospel to people that have just, you know, literally come out of their their little uh, their little huts to, because somebody turned a light on somewhere. And it was either stay by the candle or go down to where the fluorescent lights were, where there were actually amplified music. So that enough grew, drew a crowd of 300 people. Uh, and to see just people by the dozens respond to the simple message of the gospel, it's because we are all related and have the same needs. And we have the same, therefore, responsibility to our creator as well. Let's look first at the plan that God used to separate the sons of Noah this becomes crucial, uh, critical as we get towards the, uh, the end of the message as well. God does have a plan in what he's doing here. Look at verse uh, 5, for example. From these, the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. So there's distinct separations. Verse 20, these are the sons of Ham, according to their families, according to their language, in their lands and in their nations. Verse 31, these were the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, according to their, their nations. So God's plan in quarter, uh, included social order, first of all, based upon the family. That seems very obvious, but uh, God ordains the family. He ordains that there would be a father and a mother and children. That is a family. Of course, we're redefining families now in our own culture, aren't we? Because, and again, what happens is when we begin to redefine the very fabric of society that God designed and planned, then everything else in terms of culture and eventually nations begin to unravel as well. And that's part of what we're struggling with. In October 4th, 1976, when then candidate Jimmy Carter was running for office, he appeared before the National Conference of Catholic Charities. 
in an attempt to try to gain, gain their vote, talked about the fact that the family is, quote, the cornerstone of American life. And we would all agree with that. That's what we're saying here. And he said, we need to do something about it. So when he then was, was elected to office, and if you're not sure who, who Jimmy Carter was, then you're not old enough to have stood in those gas lines all night long waiting to get gas. That was Jimmy Carter. Uh, but, uh, and we could go on, but I won't. But, uh, but anyway, once he uh, did uh, take office, decided that he would, in a sense, make good on his promise to do something about his concerns over the American family. So he had a conference in 1980 called the White House Conference on Families. It was held in several cities around the country. And our good friend uh, David Hawking was in attendance at the conference in, in Southern California. Unfortunately, what came out of that conference was not this idea that we need to uphold what we're seeing here, uh, either through legislation, through taxes and so forth, and give the support to mothers and fathers to raise their children the way that they need them. What came out of it was this liberal idea that we're now very familiar with, that the family is what you make it. It could be two mommies, or it can be two daddies, or three uncles, or whatever it is. It's just simply a group of people who happen to all live in the same dwelling together. And we had a redefinition of the family uh, through that conference in 1980 that's continued into uh, this day. But God's very clear, and he says uh, a family is a father and mother and a child or children. Second part of the plan, by God's design, included a social order based on language. And really, it's language that brings about, about culture. There's many things that are cultural that we understand here. Uh, in Hawaii, <laughs> we can see it has a lot to do with food uh, and a lot of other things, but, it's, uh, but language is key and very important. When we get to chapter 11 in the Tower of Babel, we're going to mention Nimrod in a moment, but in uh, what he does there, but uh, keep in mind, he was the man who becomes the first rebellion against God after the flood. He's the one that tries to establish the first world order, the first world religious system. Therefore, he is a type of the Antichrist, this person that will come uh, in, in the future. And so what he's doing is trying to do the opposite of what God designed. He's trying to bring everybody together, in a sense, under one tent. And God says, no, go throughout the earth and be fruitful and, uh, and multiply. God has to end up dividing people off to thwart his plan by how? He confused their language and suddenly people could only relate to each other in smaller groups and they eventually then began to move out and move around the earth because language really determines culture. And certainly we've seen this uh, in our travels. When our uh, kids were, uh, were young, we would uh, host a lot of missionary families that would come through, which was always fun. And, and uh, we had some friends, uh, he had been a young uh, Navy enlisted guy and felt God's call in his life to be a missionary. And when his uh, time with the uh, Navy finished here in Pearl Harbor, went to the Philippines and established a mini uh, ministry down there. Now, he had a couple of kids, but his daughter was only, I'm going to just guess, about 20 months when they went down there. So as you can imagine, by the time they visit us, and she's like, I want to say six, five, six years old at that point, this cute little, you know, kind of light-colored, you know, blonde-haired, blue-eyed little girl, and uh, who spoke Tagalog very fluently, <laughs> just like a native speaker. And, uh, and so we were, she and I were going to Burger King to get lunch for everybody one day while they were staying with us. And I go through the drive through and I could tell by the person in the speaker talking to me that she was Filipino. I could tell by her, her accents. And I said to Abby, I said, can you tell where this person is from? by her accent. She says, no. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, well, I'm pretty sure she's from the Philippines. Oh, really? I said, yeah. So when we get around to the front and we see her, I want you to say something to her in Tagalog. What should I say? Oh, just say hello and how are you or something. Just greet her and okay. You know, so we wait our turn and we get around. And, and sure enough, it was, a, it was a, a gal that was Filipino. And, um, and, uh, and then uh, Abby Pokes her head out the window and rattles off something to her very quickly in Tagalog. And the lady's eyes lit up. She said something back. And all of a sudden, they were in this whole conversation. Uh, and then, um, uh, and I, what'd she say, Abby? She was asking me where I live and all this other stuff. And, and pretty soon, uh, every, 
three quarters of the worker of Burger King that all happened to be a Filipino at that time, all had their heads out that, that drive through window and were engaged in conversation with, with Abby. And they just went on and on and on for quite a while. And I'm sure the people behind me really appreciated that. <laughs> <clears throat> but as we were beginning to, uh, to leave, one of them said to me, you know, other than, you know, thank you for coming and stuff and allowing us to, uh, to talk with her. And, uh, and she, said, uh, she said, she's Filipina. And uh, because she was to them because of, of the language. It didn't matter what color her skin, eyes, or hair were culturally because of language. She was Filipino as far as they were concerned. And we've seen the same thing happen uh, with guys we know in China, for example. A guy from Holland that that uh, is married to Chinese and been there for a long time. And his, his Mandarin is so good, he's hired by the government on a regular basis to uh, do translation for dignitaries and so forth. Because as they said, he speaks better Chinese than most Chinese. And, uh, and we were a solid brother in the Lord. And we were at a place where we could you know, have a, a little more openness in terms of uh, sharing and so forth. And one of the belie Chinese believers, I said something about him and uh, where he was from or something. And she said, no, he's Chinese. As far as she was concerned, it didn't matter what he looked like. Language determines culture. And God designs all these things for a reason. There's a guy building a tower that says, everybody come here and I'm going to lead you in worship to this God. But God says, no, you're not. I'm going to divide you and I'm going to divide you for a reason. It's going to be by family. It's going to be by culture. It'll also be by geographical or geological borders and certainly the natural borders of the land. Uh, would cause uh, people to be divided off, and then again, social order based on nations. Uh, Romans 13, 1, Paul says this, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. God ordains and structures our culture, our society, our nations, and separates us for a very good reason. What reason is that? You must remain awake until point four to get there, because we're going to see that in the New Testament in a sermon by the Apostle Paul. But there is a plan. It's God's plan. He uses it to separate the sons of Noah. Secondly, there's a prophecy concerning the enlargement of Japheth, and that's in verses one to five. Now, this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth were Gomar, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, Tiras. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, Rifhath, and Togomar. The sons of uh, Javan were uh, Elisha, Tarshish, Ketim, and Dodamin, Dodanim. From these, the coastland people of the Gentiles separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, into the nation. So the prophecy actually comes in the previous chapter that we looked at last week in verse 27. Moses there, I believe, my opinion, at the end of his life, which would be the more typical when he would bless his sons and prophesy over them, which he does. And we spent a lot of time talking about the fact that he cursed Canaan. But the promise to Japheth was, uh, may God enlarge Japheth. What does it mean to enlarge? Well, it means to, to grow, that he would have a tremendous amount of descendants. Does that happen? Is the prophecy true? Well, actually, it's, it's more than just grow. Most of the major world empires all came from the descendants of Japheth. He has seven sons. One is Gomer. Uh, an ancient uh, Assyrian description tells us they are the people of Sumeria. They become the Indo-European nations. And uh, many uh, that study uh, uh, people groups around the world trace them directly to the Germanic people, which uh, is very interesting because one of the sons of Gomar is a, a guy named Ashkenaz, who turns out to be Jewish. Uh, so the Ashkenaz Jews are basically the Jews that come from Northern Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, that are basically rooted in a Germanic people uh, that go all the way back to this descendant of, uh, of Noah. Now, when you think of 
all the Nobel Prize winners and uh, uh, Freud and uh, Einstein, the playwrights and all that, all of those very famous uh, Jews were all Ashkenaz Jews. Uh, all of the leaders of the nation of Israel in terms of their government until very recently were all Ashkenaz uh, Jews. And they all trace their lineage back to, uh, to this man. And in fact, they're so grounded in their Germanic language that they spoke German and Hebrew and eventually combined it to their own language called Yiddish. So if your only exposure to uh, Judaism is a fiddler on the roof, you get the idea. But uh, uh, so these are the uh, uh, lineage that goes all the way back to this son of Noah. Uh, the other, other Jews that we're familiar with are more the separate ones are the Sephardic Jews, which basically come from the Middle East and, uh, and from Spain. In fact, that's a, a way of saying Spain. But uh, <clears throat> they, uh, again... Uh, at least in Israel, only till recently, haven't uh, shared power as much. But uh, one of the things that you know when you see becomes evident when you go to Israel is the complete uh, uh, diversification. I'll get that word out in a moment. But uh, of course, uh, I am ordained, so I can make up words when I need to. I know. <laughs> I just want to point that out. Tom made a word up when he was uh, during the offering. I just want to point that out that you can't do that unless you're ordained. You're going to go, what word was that? I'm not going to say. But uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, a complete uh, diversification when you go there. Blonde hair, blue eyes, the Middle Eastern look, and everything uh, in, uh, in between. But one of the descendants, very important, goes back to Gomar. Magog is the uh, present-day Russia. We're going to uh, mention Ezekiel 38 and the Ezekiel 38 invasion in just a moment. Uh, Madai are the ancient Medes who present uh, our present-day Iraqi and uh, Iranians. And I'll mention this with a few of the people group because uh, you've got folks like uh, Saddam Hussein, if anybody remembers him. He was on the scene a few years ago saying that he wanted to unite the Arab people. Too bad you're not Arab. <laughs> Didn't read this part of the Bible. But you, 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 you've got this uniting the Arab people. But most of those Islamic groups in the Middle East today, very few of them are actually Arab, which are the descendants of Ishmael. But uh, uh, again, Madai is, again, the ancient Medes, present Iraqi and Iranians. Javan are the uh, Greeks and Ionians, Tubal, the Toblish of Siberia. Again, also mentioned Ezekiel 38 invasion. And Meshach is simply a, a Hebrew way of saying the name of the group of people that founded the city of Moscow. Taras, we're not really sure about. Some would say Greek. Uh, we don't really know. The sons of Gomar, uh, again, uh, Rip Hoth, don't know much about them. Togomar, again, mentioned in Ezekiel 38. Togomar is present-day Turkey, Armenia, uh, and the Turkish-speaking people of Asia Minor, like Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and, uh, and so forth. And uh, we mentioned them, and we'll, I'll read a little bit from that Ezekiel 38 passage in a, in a moment, but just keep in, in mind that Turkey is predicted by Ezekiel to be part of an invasion to try and, and attempt to destroy the nation of Israel that is still yet, yet future, coming to a, a theater near you. Uh, it's still uh, right, on, right on the scene uh, because of the fact that, uh, well, we're just there. For thousands of years, the Russians and the Iranians were bitter enemies. And if you notice, that they're kind of getting along really good these days. And uh, uh, it's the Russians that, of course, established and helped build the nuclear programs. Uh, they have sold their advanced um, radar detection systems and uh, are putting those in place in, uh, in Iran. And there, there's a lot of money going back and forth. presents a lot of problems for the Israelis when they think about trying to uh, you know, take, take out the nuclear facilities because if they do that, they're going to kill a whole bunch of Russians that live all around them who have designed and built them and run them. And the people in Moscow are probably not going to be real thrilled about that. So there's been a, a lot of problems in trying to deal with the nuclear buildup in Iran. All of this predicted by the prophet Ezekiel uh, thousands uh, of years ago. Bring into that now Turkey, which has been somewhat of an ally uh, of Israel and a favorite vacation spot is uh, as well. But recently they have turned, it's in the news now in terms of the, the uh, flotilla that wants to break through uh, the barrier that Israel has placed around the Gaza Strip. For some reason, 
Israel doesn't like the idea of other people smuggling missiles and weapons into the Gaza Strip. I don't know why they're against that. They just seem to be. They're all about this self-defense thing. And every time they do something to try to defend themselves, they're condemned by the United Nations. I don't understand it. But uh, here we've got uh, Turkey now. That's where the ship left from uh, about a year ago on that previous attempt. And of course, uh, met with uh, disaster and there was loss of life and so forth. Things have really broken down in Turkey. Turkey, for a number of years, was moving to try to become part of NATO, part, part of the uh, European Union, moving, becoming much and much more moderate, much and much more pro-West. And that was shot down and that was rejected. And they've turned much more uh, to the uh, Islamic countries in the Middle East as a result of that. Today in the city of Istanbul, one of the best-selling books is a book by Adolf Hitler called Mein Kampf. And uh, you have much more anti-Semitism going on in Turkey than ever before. And the prophet Ezekiel said that that would happen uh, in, in the future. Let me just read the first two verses of Ezekiel's prophecy, chapter 38. Verses 1 and 2, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face against Gog. These are the places we're talking about of the land of Magog. The chief prince of Meshech and Tubal prophesy against him. And uh, we spent actually a, a whole message or two uh, when uh, things were really heating up over there uh, a year, a year and a half ago. But the prophecy goes on and says that here you have this alliance of Russia uh, and a, an alliance or confederation of, now sometimes if you read books 20 years ago, they would have said Arab states, but they're not really Arab, but they are Islamic states that come together uh, and make a move against Israel. E Ezekiel says, God will place a hook in their jaw to draw them into this conflict. And there's always been a lot of speculation as to what that might be. And of course, the most recent speculation says, because Israel has now discovered and is about ready to develop uh, multi-million dollar sites of oil right off the Mediterranean, that might do it. That might be enough to bring them into the conflict. Of course, Ahmadinejad believes that if he can unleash nuclear weapons in the Middle East against Israel, he can fulfill his own theological dream of bringing the 12th Imam or the Islamic Messiah back to set up his own kingdom. So he's got his own ideas. Russian, of course, through Putin is more driven by money and power than theological ideas. Ezekiel says this is going to happen, but God will intervene on behalf of the nation of Israel and destroy two-thirds of their armies, which would remove Russia and Iran as any kind of major players in the Middle East or in the world today, which would cause the rise of Iraq, which is predicted in terms of the rebuilding of the nation of Babylon. So if you want to listen to the 50 messages on Revelation, you can get caught up in all of that. But uh, here it is in, uh, in Genesis 10 in these gene genealogies, the identifications of where these nations come from. Gog is a leader. Magog is the country of Russia. Gog is the title, not, uh, not a place itself. Uh, and again, Magog has been identified by historians as the ancient Scythians. These were a bloodthirsty nomadic people migrated to southern Russia in the 7th and 8th centuries. Rosh, or Rosh uh, Meshach, and Tubal, again, are references to Russia, Moscow, and the Toblish people. And, uh, and that uh, invasion is, is yet to be, uh, to be done, but their ancestry goes back to the Table of Nations. And then the sons of uh, Javan were uh, Elisha, Tarshish, Katim, and Dodanim. So Javan is the uh, Greeks or the uh, Ionians. Uh, Elisha refers to Cilicia uh, and possibly Sardinia. Uh, Tarshish is used uh, several times uh, in the Old Testament, I think over 50 times. Remember when Jonah was going to flee because he didn't want to go prophesize up in ancient Assyria to the, to the Ninevites. He pretty much hated their guts. So he, he didn't want to go up there. He was afraid that, uh, that he would preach a, a message of repentance and, and they might repent and God would, would not judge them. And he pretty much wanted God to judge them since they pretty much killed and tortured most of his family and friends that live in northern, uh, the northern part of uh, Israel. So where does he run to? The farthest place he could possibly get, which was Tarshish. Again, Tarshish is mentioned many times. 
uh, and uh, it's uh, e Ezekiel that talks about, or excuse me, Isaiah, as well as uh, Psalm 72.10, makes reference to its islands. So some people say, okay, therefore it's an island nation, talks about its uh, shipping and so forth. Uh, and then it talks about the young lions or the merchants of Tarshish. So who are the young lions or the merchants of Tarshish? Well, those are people that have an alliance with and shipping with and economic ties to. So if we can identify who Tarshish is, maybe we can figure out who the other people are. And so a lot of people are trying to find, can you tell I'm talking really fast? I can just tell I'm going to run over otherwise. <laughs> A lot of people try to tie the United States into end times prophecy. If the United States is the most powerful nation military in the world, which we are, if we are the greatest nation in the world, which we are, how come we're not mentioned in end times prophecy if we're on the threshold of that? And so what they try to look at and find out and identify who is Tarshish. And by speculation, some of the things said in the text, they would say it's Great Britain. And since we have ties with him economically, we become part of the merchants of Tarshish. And in the Ezekiel 38 passage, when that invasion begins, Tarshish and a group of nations that are mentioned, they protest against it, but do nothing to help Israel. And, uh, and certainly we could see Great Britain falling into that. We could see uh, the European Union falling into that. Uh, and uh, it would be hard to see the United States falling into that and not supporting our chief uh, ally uh, in the Middle East. But uh, we're seeing that changed <laughs> as well, aren't we? As our, our, our current president kind of threw him under the bus a few weeks ago in terms of the peace talks, saying that uh, to begin with, they should go back to pre-1967 borders. So interesting things going on. If you want to read more, Mark Hitchcock, who we had for our last prophecy conference, wrote a, a very fine book called The Late Great United States, identifies some of the major players and, and shoots down some of, the, some of the other theories that are out there in terms of where is the United States uh, here in Bible prophecy. Uh, a lot of other scholars, some very good guys, will make a case for Spain being Tarshish as well. Uh, Kitim is uh, the uh, capital of Cyprus, refers to the Greek culture. Dodaim is uh, speculation, uh, says it's roads and... Uh, there's a, a few other opinions out there. What's the point? See, I knew that you were thinking, what is the point of all this? The point is, is that God had a plan from the beginning to divide us up into families and into culture by language to geographic locations that he would spread us out by nations around the world. Uh, and that's what we see. Uh, he prophesied that uh, through Noah, that the tents of Japheth would be enlarged. Uh, pretty sure that happened. They are the Greeks, the Romans, the Russians, and the uh, European people are all descendants of Japheth. I think that pretty much covers most of the, uh, the world empires. So there was a plan, there was a prophecy. Let's look at the people who descended from, from Ham, verse 6 to 20. The sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Put, Canaan. The sons of Cush were Zeba, Havilah, Sh Sh Shapta, Ra'ama, Sabteka, and the sons of Ra'ama were Sheba and Dedan. Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. In the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, or Babel, uh, Iraq, uh, Akkad, Kalna, Kalne, in the land of Shinar. From that land he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, Kala, and Razin between Nineveh and Kala, that is the principal city. Mizraim begot Ludim, Anamim, Lehabim, Neftuhim, Patrushim, Kashluhim, from which came uh, from whom came the Philistines and the Katorim. Canaan begot Sidon, his firstborn, and Haith, the Jebusite, the Amorite, the Gergesite, the Hivite, the Archite, the Sinite, the Arvadite, the Zemarite, the Hamathite. Afterward, the families of the Canaanites were dispersed. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as far as you go to Gara, as far as Gara, Gaza. Then as you go down towards Sodom, Gomorrah, Adam, Zeboim, as far as Lesha. These were the sons of Ham, or Ham, according to their families, according to their languages, in their languages, and in their nations. 
Anybody want to hear that again real quick? You're not gonna, it's not going to happen. The sons of Ham. Uh, and very interesting. There's actually five, but uh, notice four are mentioned together, and then, and then Nimrod is kind of thrown in, again, because he becomes distinctive, and there's more said about him because he's going to build the first world religious order, the first world government, as he uh, builds the, the ziggurat there on the east side of the Euphrates River. Cush refers to uh, Ethiopia, would be a, a much larger landmass than the country of that name. Uh, currently, again, Nimrod uh, becomes this important character. He is separated from the other sons. Also, again, he is not a son of Ishmael uh, and not an Arab, but certainly a type of the Antichrist. Uh, notice in verse 8, uh, Cush begot Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one on the earth, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Nimrod's name appears all over the Mesopotamian Valley. Uh, when we talk about uh, the Tower of Babel, it is called uh, in present day language, if you look it up, a ziggurat. There's over 24 of the remains of these ziggurats uh, in uh, present day Iraq today. So here's my question, John. When you're flying your helicopter over there, did you see any ziggurats? Did you see any of these kind of tower or the remains from them? Yeah, you can see towers. Yeah, and uh, so they're, they're all over the place. Uh, once in a while, you can even kind of catch a glimpse on the news during that time if you saw some uh, aerial shots of, uh, of a present-day Iraq. But the one with Nimrod's name on it is on the east side of the Euphrates, and that's very important as we get to some other passages uh, uh, here in a moment. Nimrod means to revolt or to rebel. So this becomes the first rebellion against God after the flood. When it says he's a mighty one on the earth or a mighty hunter before the Lord, it also means in the eyes of the Lord. It also can mean against the Lord. So here's a guy that has tremendous power and influence to lead many people against the Lord. Uh, Babel actually means, Bob means the gate, El God. He is building the gate of God. And uh, we'll look more at that next week. But he's saying, come to the gate of God. You don't have to worship that God who is the creator God, the God of, of, uh, of uh, Adam and the God of Noah and uh, the God of his descendants. But you can come and I'll show you a God that will make you self-sufficient. And, uh, and we can build a tower and look to the stars, and those stars can tell us our future. We don't have to be dependent upon uh, the God that you've been worshiping before, the gate of God. Uh, recently, or not that long ago, there was a, a large statue uncovered of the head of, uh, of Nimrod, uncovered uh, in Nineveh. For years, the city of Kalne was... Uh, uh, so completely destroyed it could not be found and therefore Bible critics said that here's a mistake in the Bible but in 1845 Sir Austin Henry Layer discovered the ruins of the city uh, and as I said his name is all over Mesopotamia when we talk about the Tower of Babel it is not a folklore myth story somehow to teach us an illustration it is an actual place it's an actual event and, and the archaeological evidence is there to support it one of the interesting things found but from a, a group known as the Kali or Kaldi, who are the priestly line of the Chaldeans, an inscription by them says this about Nimrod. Very interesting. Cush begot Nimrod, who began to prevail in wickedness, for he slew innocent blood and rebelled against Jehovah. That's not from the Bible. That's from an archaeological discovery of a group of people that are against them, but they are actually saying exactly what the Bible says here. And that's what archeology span does. And that's why it's awesome. Because every time those guys put a shovel in the ground in the Middle East and they find a stone or a name, they can go to the Bible and find out how it relates, where it came from, where it is. And again, the list of these names are actual people and, uh, and the archeological evidence is to support what we're seeing in God's word. Uh, Mizraim uh, is Egypt. Uh, in verse 14, it talks about who comes from them. Pathrushim, uh, Kasluhim, from whom came the Philistines. This becomes very interesting because the current day Palestinians in their negotiations will make a case to say that they are derived from the ancient Palestinians. 
Palestinians actually are, again, a seagoing uh, people, but trace their roots according to God and God's word uh, back to the Egyptians themselves. The reason that the Palestinians make a case to do that is so that they can say, try to make a case to say, see, we're, we were in the land. Because uh, Israel, of course, is saying that as the Jewish people, this is the land of our forefathers. This is the land of, uh, of Abraham. And uh, ever since Joshua came into the land, we've had a Jewish presence in the land ever since then. Uh, it's ours and, uh, and we ought to be here. There's a, a, a joke I was telling Josh uh, yesterday morning, but uh, it's a story that uh, is, reoccurs occasionally because of this issue. And that is that uh, there's peace negotiations that are about ready to begin. Prime Minister Netanyahu says, uh, before we begin, I would like to tell a little story about the history of our people. History is very important to us as Jewish people. And so before we begin, I would just like to tell a little story. He says, we all know that Abraham, our father, came into this land and God gave him the land. But we also know that through the sons of, uh, of uh, Jacob, one of them, Joseph, ends up being the prime minister of Egypt at that time when our people began to live in Egypt. But of course, you know, they all became slaves. But God raised up the writer of the Torah, Moses, our savior, who came in and delivered the people and then brought them out of that bondage and took them through the Sinai Peninsula. But of course, you know also that the people cried out because there was not enough water. But God told Moses to take his staff and strike a rock and out would flow gushing water. And of course it did and formed this beautiful lake. But what you don't know is this. Moses there in that 115 degree heat, looking upon that water, there was really nobody around. He decided to take off his robes and dive in and cool off a little bit. And what you don't know is what happened next when he got out of the water. When he got out of the water, Mr. Mr. Abbas, what happened then is his clothes were all gone. And Abbas says, listen, don't blame us. We weren't even there. And the prime minister says, thank you. Now that we've cleared that up, let's go on with our negotiations. <laughs> but this, this idea, where do the Philistines come from? They all would go all the way back to, uh, to uh, really from the Egyptians. Then there's put, which is uh, people used to say, we're not really sure where to put put. But now they say he's from the country of Libya. Canaan, we discussed uh, last week. So there's a plan. There's a prophecy. The people who descended from Ham. Uh, and then the position of Shem in the plan of God. Verses 21 to 32. And children were also born to Shem. The father of all the children of Aber. The brother of Japheth, the elder. Again, notice that Japheth is the oldest. Uh, when they go on the ark at Shem, Ham, Japheth. Because Shem becomes... Uh, again, the ancestor of the Messiah. So he is listed first, but in actual birth order, Japheth is the oldest. The sons of Shem were Elam, Ashur, Arphaxet, Lud, Aram. The sons of Aram were Uz, Hu, Gether, and Mas. Arphaxet begot Salah, Salah begot Eber. To Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. Talk more about that in a moment. And his brother's name was Jachthan. Jachthan begot Alam, uh, Almodad, Shelef, Hazamavith, Jerah, Haduram, Uzel, Dikla, Obal, Abimael, Sheba, Ophir, Havala, and Jobab. I think it was from the south. Billy Bob was his brother's <laughs> name, I'm pretty sure. Jobab. All these were the sons of Jachthan, and their dwelling place was from Mesha, as far as you go towards Shephar, the mountain of the east. These are the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, according to their nations. These were the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations, in their nations, and from these, the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. The name Shem itself means the name. It's used over 800 times in the Old Testament because even to this day, Jews will not say the name of God. We use an abbreviated form and say Yahweh or Jehovah. They would just say the name. And it's interesting because this lineage of the Messiah goes all the way back to a person called the name. Uh, the sons of Shem were Elam, Ashur, and then there's Arphaxet, which uh, becomes uh, very important. Elam is the ancient people of Persia. Uh, once again, they are not Arab either. Ashur, the, Ash, uh, the ancestors of the Assyrian Empire, uh, and then Arphaxet. Arphaxet is uh, uh, very important because he has a son named Eber. And Eber is the derivative 
of the word Hebrew. So if you're an underliner in your Bible, that's where we get the term Hebrew. It means to cross over the river. Now I mentioned the ziggurat being built on the east side of the Euphrates before. This becomes very interesting. Uh, his name is, means to cross over the river. Why did he cross over the river? Because over here on this side, uh, a tower is being built. <clears throat> the gate of God to worship another God that is not the God of, of, of heaven and earth, the God that's the creator. It, actually, they're going to worship him in terms of, of an idol. And so they crossed over the river and moved on so as to not do that. Joshua makes reference to this in Joshua 24, just to read a couple of verses from there. This is Joshua at the end of his life, kind of his last big exhortation uh, to the people. And he makes reference to this. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river, led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. He took him from beyond the river. Verse 14, Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites, or in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we're going to be Hebrews because we've crossed over. And then he ends up naming his son Peleg, which means the earth is divided. And the earth is divided today between two groups of people. Those that will walk and serve the true living God because they've crossed over and left idolatry and self-sufficiency behind what man could say is an attempt to reach out to God at the gate of God, and they determine the earth is divided, Peleg, we're going to cross over Hebrew and follow the true living God. So very, very interesting what we have in their, uh, in their names. The earth was divided. It continues to be divided today. And then there's Lut. He's associated with Persia and Put. And then Aram becomes the father of the Arameans. And of course, their language kind of catches on, Arabic, and is spoken uh, throughout the, the Middle East uh, and uh, continues to be to this day. This is the place where when Jacob is going to get a wife, he goes to Padam Aram. This is where he goes. So these guys are definitely tied into uh, the tribes of Jacob and the Messiah as well. Again, Shem, again, has this ancestor that eventually becomes the Messiah himself. Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, uh, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So again, uh, Messiah had to be of David's lineage. He had to be a son of Abraham. In Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 3, verse 23, we have Mary's lineage. There it says, Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph. And if you go on down to verse 35, the son of Peleg, the son of Aber, the son of Shelah, the son of Kainan, the son of Arphaxet, the son of Shem, the son of Noah. So there's the, the lineage of the Messiah. Therefore, Shem's genealogy and his name become outstanding. And the sons of Noah are not listed by age, but by importance, Shem, Ham, uh, and Japheth. Again, so God divides them into nations. He divides them into culture, divides them into language, divides them into families. And as I mentioned before, and I know you've been holding your breath for 45 minutes now, why does he do this? Well, Paul tells us in Acts 17, uh, if you want to turn there, but I've got it for you as well. Remember, Paul's there in the uh, uh, Mars Hill, what's called the Aragopia. So there in Athens, he's coming to the city, seeing all the idols. Uh, and, uh, and is heartbroken over it. He's uh, invited to go up to this area where all the philosophers gather, and he's new in town, so they want to hear what he has to say. He starts out very diplomatically. He says, I can tell that you're all very religious people because I've seen the, the, the many idols in your city. But I notice an idol that's to the unknown God, and I want to tell you about that God. And then he begins to, to give them the speech that ties in with our passage here. Verse 24 of Acts 17, 
Again, the only time we've got a recorded sermon of Paul preaching to Gentiles, so it becomes very important to us understand not only what he's saying, but how we should be witnessing to those around us that don't have a religious background. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is, is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives life to all, breath in all things. He is made from one blood. That's our point here in, uh, in the table of nations. Every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the, bound, uh, the, the boundaries of their dwellings. Okay, so why did he do this? Why does he divide them? Verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art or man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Paul says that God divided people into culture, languages, and nations, and families for a reason. It's so that in that condition, they would find themselves needy, and they would look to God and cry out to God that they might know him. He says they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. He says he is the creator, and uh, he is not confined to the limits that we might place upon him. He's the sustainer of life. Therefore, we need to be dependent upon him, not he upon us. And he is the ruler of nations, and we are made in his image. And there's a gulf and a separation that is created by language, by culture, by nations. But the greatest separation is our sin that has separated us. And he says, your own poets state that, that God is the creator. You say that, and yet you worship these idols. And so basically, he's kind of taking to task how ludicrous it is for these philosophers who claim to be the intellectuals of the day, but are worshiping idols. You say God's the creator, and you're worshiping that stick and stone. Do we see any contradiction here? So he's, he's making it apologetic, of course, as to why they should turn their faith to Jesus Christ. And then he ends it by saying he is the judge of the world. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. And his judgment will be universal. It'll be everywhere. It'll be with justice. And it will be very, very definite. So we're united by a common ancestry. We're united with a common responsibility to know God and to worship him. And God divided things off and actually, in a sense, made it more difficult so that we would see our own need so that when the Messiah did come, and Paul delivers this message, they would know and understand that God is the creator and there is a way to, to know him and turn towards him. And that's why Jesus then in the great commandment, sometimes uh, referred to as the great commission, in Matthew 20, 18 says, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. It's everyone that needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel of Jesus Christ can connect with everyone because we're all from the same ancestries and we all have the same needs. Does that happen? Yes, it does. Because one day in heaven, we're going to sing this song of Revelation 5, 9. It says, and they sang a new song saying, you're worthy to take the scroll to open its seals for you were slain and you redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. It has made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. One day we'll all stand before the throne of God. The gospel will have gone out to every people and language and tribe and someone from every people and language and tribe and nation will be there around the throne of God, worshiping God. And of course, we're all gonna worship in English, right? Because we're not up to learning new languages. No, <laughs> whatever that language is, we're gonna know it. And we won't even need Rosetta Stone to figure it out. We're just going to know it. Praise God. 
and we're going to worship the Lord together. All the peoples of the earth, a common ancestry, a common responsibility. On the farthest hill I will sing.